Hi guys, so I am back in Santa Inez with my glorious, beautiful sister. And I am just taking a little retreat from just kind of the craziness that has been going on at home with two sick kids and oh, it feels good. It feels really good to be up here. If you can see the um, beautiful view up there, it's just stunning. I hope you can see that. Um, anyway, <clears throat> got a little froggy in my throat. <coughs> um, I wanted to let you know that like, I truly have had some revelation and the revelation has been that when I am truly ready to confess, God is truly ready to bless because ever since I told you guys that I struggle with God being, that Jesus is, you know, the son of God that, I know he's the son of God, but what I struggled with was that the God of the entire universe sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth for us, and that he is the one way, the one truth, and the life. And um, ever since I confessed that, <clears throat> something really beautiful has been um, brewing inside of me. I just feel this stirring and this acceptance and this peace around it um, and this feeling of, yeah, why wouldn't God have sent holy perfection, absolute sinlessness, perfect holy holiness to planet earth i know people don't like it when i say planet earth but to me it just helps signify that we're like in this vast galaxy you know and we're like on this little blue marble spinning around we are actually on a planet it's really um mind-boggling but why wouldn't god have sent that holy perfect sinless perfect love to this planet to uh to live and die for us perfect holiness needed to die for us in order for us to become holy in order for us to become like our savior he became like us so that we could become like him and it really dawned on me that I need to be ruthless with myself. I can't let myself off the hook for a second when it comes to Jesus. Because what I've noticed is, and what I'm really beginning to notice now after my confession the other day, is that God's not okay with 95% of my heart. That's just not enough for him. He wants all of my heart, 100% of my heart. Uh, and he won't settle for anything less. He's not going to do it. He is relentless. He's going to finish the work that he started. And he's going to do the same with you. That's what he's in the process of doing. So if it feels like your life is falling apart, if it feels like you're coming apart at the seams, if it feels like you're you know, uh, your, your life is um, crumbling right before your eyes, dismantling. Just remember that everything might just be falling into place and God might just be breaking everything down so he can build it back up. Remember what I said the other day about him coming into the house and renovating and pulling out the pipes and knocking down walls and we're sitting here going, what are you doing? And he's building a palace suitable for him to live in. He's not just building a little cottage for you, a cozy little cottage. No, he's building a palace that's suitable for him to dwell in inside your body. So, hallelujah, amen for that revelation. Oh, excuse me. I have some holy notes that I want to refer to. I've got lots of notes today, and this might be a little longer than usual. Um, but what I loved was this. Did you know that it's possible for your soul to be saved and for your life to be seemingly wasted in the eyes of others? Yeah. So people might think that 
you know, your relationship with God and you putting Jesus first in everything. You know, I woke up this morning and I said, I live for Jesus. I breathe for Jesus. I worship Jesus. I eat for Jesus so that I can be strong and praise him. I love for Jesus. I, um, I sing to Jesus. Everything that I do, I do for Jesus. And I'm not saying that literally, that's kind of my goal, but yeah, like I really believe that that's where I'm headed. <laughs> that's what it's looking like. I'm working for Jesus, I'm breathing for Jesus, you know, I'm, I'm listening for Jesus. Uh, it's all for Jesus. It's all for him. This one, this one life will soon be passed and only what's done for Jesus will last. We've got to keep our minds on the eternal. But getting back to my note, a lot of people, if you're living your life that way, a lot of people are going to see that as a very fruitless, fruitless act. And they are going to think, wow, Jimmy, Jenny, Cindy, they are throwing their lives away. For what? But there's something in the Bible that says like, uh, you must lose your life in order to gain your life. And it is so true. We have to die to Jesus in order to actually live. And um, I'm so excited because I felt this feeling in my heart this morning, like no matter what happens, no matter what, I have received the greatest blessing and the greatest gift that anyone on this earth in mankind could ever receive. And that is salvation and the love that I feel for Jesus in my heart and to know that Jesus Christ loves me unconditionally and that he is a place for me in eternity and a place for you in eternity okay back to my holy notes I'm kind of in a really Zen like peaceful place this morning so if I seem a little mellow it's actually a good thing I'm just kind of like feeling the breeze and sitting outside and hearing the birds and it's super lovely um, so each of the Gospels is either the work of madness or blinding revelation because it is pretty radical and extreme, the Gospels. Uh, and so it was either like a lunatic or several lunatics wrote the Gospel, wrote the Gospels. Um, or uh, they were actually, you know, being, uh, had revelation, you know what I mean? They were, they were inspired, whole, wholly inspired by God to write it down. And, um, you know, other religions say that they say, this is the way to God. And Jesus says, no. I am the way to God. And then religions will say, this is how you find truth. And Jesus says, no, I am the truth. And other religions will say, this is how you find life. And Jesus says, no, I am the life. The gospel is Jesus Christ. It's himself. It is his own revelation. It is his identity. The gospel is Jesus. It's who he is. He is the life. And I just love that, you know? And he does not like lukewarm. He's like, crown me or kill me. Do not like me. I don't want to be liked. So either crown me or kill me because that's your only choice. 
I won't accept anything less than that. And that's just been revealed to me so clearly over these past few days since I made my confession with my lips that I struggled with the God, the Alpha and the Omega, sending one person to our planet Earth. <laughs> I'm gonna keep saying planet for that person who's like, it makes it sound like Jesus is an alien. We do live on a planet and it's holy and it's radical and it's mind blowing that we live on a planet. I love saying that. Isn't it Jesus? Isn't make, Jesus isn't an alien. It doesn't make him an alien. He created the planet himself <laughs> with the work of his own hands. So ever since I confessed that, you guys, freedom, peace, God is willing to bless when we're willing to confess. Okay. Um, Jesus will orchestrate um, that message of crown me or kill me in your heart if you are truly being sanctified by the Holy Spirit because he won't expect anything less of you. He finishes the work he started. And so there's going to be this persistence. He's chasing after us. He wants everything. And sometimes I just sit there scratching my head like, you have got to be kidding me, God. Like, are you serious? I've given you this and I've given you that and I've let go of this and I have denounced that. It's not good enough. Nope. Nope. Not good enough. And you know why? Because he loves us so much that he wants us to have radical freedom and radical joy and radical peace and radical transformation. Okay, if you come to Jesus and say, I need help, he's gonna say, my glasses are filthy. He's gonna say, oh yeah, I can do that. I can give you help. And I will also be your comforter, your shield, your friend, your advocate, your king, your savior. But either I will have all of you or none of you. There's nothing in between with Jesus. It's crown me or kill me, guys. Timothy Keller, who I love and adore, wonderful pastor and doctor, um, is uh, struggling right now with a very serious cancer diagnosis and I would ask you all to pray for him. He has, uh, I believe, stage four pancreatic cancer, which is a very challenging cancer. Well, he's one of my favorite, he is my favorite pastor. I've learned so much from him over the years. And um, I listen to one of his sermons at least two, three times a week. Um, and it just fills me with such, um, such eye-opening, um, heart-filling, heart, uh, you know, it's like he just opens my heart. Every time I listen to his sermons, I learn something new and I get those golden nuggets of, uh, not Pokey's golden nuggets, but the Lord's golden nuggets. Big, big difference. Um, and one thing uh, that I read the other day that I thought was really, really powerful was the one thing we can add to our salvation is the sin that made salvation necessary. That's the only thing we can add to salvation is our sin. Because our sin is the only thing that made salvation necessary, you guys. That's it. That's it. And he roots out that sin in us. And there are sins that are, sins that are so subtle that we don't even realize we're engaging in. And then, boom, he like takes the blinders off and puts on our love lenses. And we're able to see 
into ourselves like x-ray vision in a way that we never were before. And we're able to see our corruption, even the most subtle, subtle little things he brings to surface so that we can examine it and we can ask ourselves, wow, is this of the Lord? Is this who I am now? Is this the, who I want to be? Do I want to be represented in this way? Is this, who I'm is this what I'm defined by still? And so much of the time the answer is no, uh-uh. I'm not defined by this anymore. I can't be defined by this anymore. I literally can't be defined by this behavior anymore. Um, okay, getting to the end here. So true repentance. So nothing is more valuable than Jesus. Whatever we're putting before Jesus, it must be put to death. That's true repentance, recognizing that we're putting be what we're putting before him and repenting about that. So basically that's idols. Whatever we start to realize as an idol, uh, we need to crucify. We need to crucify that. And you know, on Instagram the other day, I posted who would dare to throw the blood of Jesus back in his face. And a lot of people, I think, were very struck by that. And some people were offended by that. And some people were, uh, you know, very shaken by it. And so was I. I was very shaken by it, which is why I posted it. Because um, when somebody truly takes the time to read the Gospels and read what Jesus says and then read how he was uh, martyred and to read um, how he was resurrected and ascended and to read his words that are pure truth and to read and to see his glory come off the pages and then to know that he bled for you and for me, how could anyone ever dare to not listen to his words? How could anyone ever dare to not read the gospels, to not even read them, to not give Jesus a chance, but instead to just say, no thanks, sir not for me, and just throw his blood back in his face. There are people who do that. So not I, not you. Um, we can only hold out empty hands and receive salvation as a gift. And we can only pray to be able to be bold about that salvation. Be bold and unafraid. You know, so many Christians were, ter were terrified to go out and preach the gospel because they knew, I mean, there are stories of Christians being tied to two different horses and, you know, their arms and their legs on one horse, you know, arms on one and legs on the other, and then they just let the horses go and they're ripped apart or people, you know, drilling holes into people's heads and putting molten, you know, uh, uh, silver? computer into their brains alive while they're alive or being burned at the stakes they had a lot to lose their lives but they did it anyway they did it anyway so why can't we be bold for, for Jesus be bold for the one who has created a place for us in eternity be bold for the one who is restoring us and rejuvenating us um, and you know, he's the one who said, the Father sent me over and over again. That's what gets me. That's what gets me. The Father sent me. I don't say anything unless I'm instructed by the Father to say it. The Father. The Father is the God of the universe. The one I struggle with that would send Jesus. I believe, guys, I'm getting there. I'm getting there.
thank you for your prayers. It's like I had a revelation. My heart broke open. That God, the Father who sent me, sent me, sent me. How many times did Jesus say that? That Father is the God of the universe, the Alpha and the Omega, sent, perfect, holy, sinless love to this planet to die on our behalf because we are so broken, so broken, so sinful. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I just want to say lastly, God is not absent anywhere and our, mo our mortal minds can't really grasp that, that like at the deepest, deepest ends of space, God dwells. He's there. Inside the little tiny leaf in your backyard or on a plant, inside a worm, you know, blowing through the trees, the wind that's blowing through the trees. God is present everywhere. There's nowhere that he is absent. Nowhere. Sometimes I think about a little spider in like a old shed in, in like New Zealand, but like on a vast farm, you know? And that little spider is spinning a web and God knows before that spider even spins the web exactly the dimensions of that web, the blueprint of that web, just a little spider in the middle of nowhere. That's who God is. That's how smart he is. That's how the, our designer does it. He's, he knows, he knows everything. God has never learned one thing. He's never had to learn anything. He's God. So just to wrap this up, the king, this king, the gentle king, the dying king, the servant king, the king on a donkey, the king higher than the heavens yet came so low for us is the king that comes into your life he will turn you into a gentle king. The paradoxical weakness, think about it. The gospel is the opposite of everything we are taught here on earth. That through weakness, through surrender, we gain our godly strength. That's paradoxical to what we are learning here on earth. It's an upside down kingdom, you guys. The kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. Because universal religion says we're saved through strength. No, we're not. We're saved through weakness. So let's not get dressed in the morning to be spiritually naked all day, you guys. Put on his majesty. Put on his robe. Let's be dressed today for success in Jesus Christ. I love you all. And Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Be fishers of men. And remember not to major on the minor today and to think of things in an eternal way. Because everything that we can see is temporary, but what we can't see is eternal. Ciao for now.